of Midwest Book Review. We have been corresponding and talking about trends in industry. My name is Tracy Smoke, an author that you have helped tremendously over the last few years. We've been looking at your wealth of experience close to half a century in <laughs> publishing and watching books and reading books and looking at trends. Today, you picked the topic and you wanted to talk a little bit about startling statistics and what are some of the trends that you're seeing in publishing. And you have a heart to champion the little guy or little gal, which would be the self-published um, authors or the small presses. And that's largely what you dedicate Midwest Book Review to, is advocating literacy and helping diversify voices. So talk to us a little bit. What are some of these startling statistics that you've come across? Well, one of the things that they never teach you in your creative writing classes on your road to becoming the next great American novelist is the practicalities, the business side of publishing. Well, I've got some good news and some bad news, <laughs> specifically for the independent author, the independent publisher, but even what affects what we call the mid-list authors published by the major houses as well. Now, when it comes to statistics and facts about the U.S. book market, there's a gal named Amy Watson, who is a remarkable expert on American book sales data. And her latest report can be accessed online. And I'm, Tracy, I'm going to send you a link to the original report so you can make it available to, to our Sure, audience. I'll put it in our description. But while the U.S. book industry has faced immense challenges over the last two or three decades, ranging from the increased popularity of digital media to the hardships faced by retail brick-and-board bookstores, uh, but uh, books still remain an important factor in consumers' daily lives. That's the good news. Print book figures have improved and unit sales now consistently surpass 700 million per year in the U.S. But 700 hey, million books sold. Okay, and that's in the physical print copy. Physical book. And that's just the U.S. market? Print also remains the most popular book format among U.S. consumers with 65% of adults having read a print book in the last 12 months. Not too shabby. Well, the, there are sales here from retail bookstores and, and this report uh, goes over how major booksellers are affected like Barnes and Noble and Amazon and what the print, what the brick and board bookstores have to do to compete and uh, make alliances and create their own online book selling opportunities. But in 2022, U.S. book revenue grew across subcategories, and in, despite gains in the digital book, you know, the e-book, the Kindles, we're talking about the print book continues to be a $3.2 billion uh, total in hardcover books, paperbacks, and mass market paperbacks, you know, trade paperbacks, mass market. Uh, print continues to be the dominant review driver or revenue driver for the U.S. book market. That's the good news. Oh, I like it. Here's the bad news. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. It has made desktop publishing technology has so rapidly advanced. In fact, it's starting to advance into the unknown of artificial intelligence like chatbot, but it has so dramatically made it easier and easier and cheaper and cheaper to publish a book yourself. But that the problem with that, though, is you have to 
put in some, shall we call it in-service training. You have to do it yourself, a DIY schedule of learning how to be effective once you've made your manuscript into a print publication, hardcover or paperback or both. You have to learn the value of editing. You have to learn the importance, the critical marketing importance of cover art for your book. What's it going to look like? Not just when a potential customer holds it in their hands and uh, trying to make a decision, but it, what do all the other books in your particular genre or field or category look like? Think of it as a beauty pageant, <laughs> <laughs> a literary beauty pageant. <laughs> because I can tell you now, as a reviewer and as a dedicated, hardcore bibliophile, that covers can make or break a book. You can look at a cover and not be motivated to open it to see what's inside. Let's let's talk about that just a little bit more. So if if I hear what you're suggesting, if someone is on a limited budget, like we've talked about, right. one place to really splurge and not cut corners is a cover. What what are some things? I mean, you said that you see 30 submissions a day. Let me give you my no strings, shoe strings, budgeted, self-publishing author trying to figure out a good cover for their particular book. Photography, more specifically, public domain images, which range from photographs to paintings. Uh, and there are websites dedicated to public domain artwork. Yeah, I artwork. will, I will and, tell you that as a photographer, three of my books are nature art photography. And in the process of blogging, there are two online companies. One is called Pixabay, P is in Paul, I-X-A-B-A-Y, and also Unsplash. However, when I looked at their terms of contract yesterday, because I was getting some artwork for um, a, another blog, and it says that in order for it to be copyright or royalty free, that the art needs to somehow be adapted or modified, not just the original mm -hmm. art, and it cannot promote a brand or something separate for commercial purposes. So I would just caution um, new people like myself learning the ropes that yes, artwork is essential, but you really need a mentor or someone looking over your shoulder to ensure that you won't have a nightmare later that you thought something was royalty free, but it still required a license permit. And one good way to figure all this out is turn to your fabulous Google machine and <laughs> type in the words public domain artwork. And also, again, a, a, your second search, publish or public domain photography. And I'll tell you how it's really easy to have that little touch of modification that makes everything kosher. You've got a title, you've got an author's name, mm -hmm. and you don't need to use the entire image if there's a piece of it mm -hmm. that you know expanded would make a dandy a cover for your art. There you are. Oh, and by the way, you know, you're right. You, you can't market your book like Campbell's Soup and try to make that piece of art your brand image. No, no, we're just talking about a thematically appropriate, eye-catching, distinguish amongst the crowd image for the front cover of your book. And by the way, I would keep it as uncluttered by letters as possible because a lot of books I see have a nice, short, succinct title. 
and an elongated subtitle. Well, sometimes you have to, especially in academic publishing, have a long subtitle. But uh, just, just be cautious and, and keep your subtitle, you know, as succinct as possible, and that still does the job. <laughs> so do you like some white space on a cover so there's room to sort of savor what is the artwork and what are the power-packed words in the title? It's a coin toss, actually. And just speaking for myself and my own biases as a reviewer, I, I prefer that, that the image cover the entire book, but that the lettering stands out. You choose the font and the font size and the font coloring that sort of is easily distinguishable from the background artwork. That's what works best for me. Now, other people, other tastes, you know, fine. I, I don't discriminate against the book simply because uh, it has a border or anything like that. Although I will discriminate against a book that has a horrible, ghastly. I thought you were trying to get people to open this book and give it a shot artwork. <laughs> well, let and me ask you. Me many times when when authors have said, "Why why didn't my book?" past that initial screening, I have to tell them it was because the book is non-competitive when sitting on a bookstore shelf in its particular genre or, or category. Let me, let me ask you this, Jim, for us to wrap up today's session. We've talked about the importance of a cover. It's kind of like, I guess, you go to a, a job interview and they say you only get one opportunity to make a first impression. So I think I read that there are 4 million new titles a year in the U.S. market. That's including self-published and, you know, the, the bestseller ranking. So 3.9. If, if you're a new voice and you're competing with close to 4 million other titles, you have like a three minute, three second window for your cover. Exactly. How, about, how about the back? I know yeah. some people talk about a short description. They talk about a possible endorsement. What would you advise a new person as far as how much on the back cover and what? Right. In terms of hardcore marketing, okay, a succinct description of the book should be on the end paper that's full, you know, you've got your cover and the end paper comes off. That's on, on the front. That's where the succinct description of the book should be. And on the end paper for the back cover, that's where an author's biography, an illustrator's biography, uh, some such thing like that should be. On the, uh, on the spine of the book, clearly the title, the author, and a publisher logo of some si sort is really nice if you happen to have one. Otherwise, the publisher's name. On the back itself, two, even three, succinct, like one-liner, or two-liner quotes, and the source identified. If it was a publication like the Chicago Times, or if it was an author, especially if the author is well known in that particular genre or subject matter, you know, that's it. And then down at the bottom, you you need that barcode, and you need you need to put the the ISBN number and the price that uh, unless you want to keep it deliberately unpriced for the fluctuation of future sales off your backlist. But it also doesn't hurt to have a contact information like your, your professional website, if you're an author or a publisher, your professional www.xxx.com mm -hmm. website link. Uh, those are the those are the basics, I think. Okay. So one thing I learned is like we've said in Midwest Book Review, you don't want the book 
until it's available for purchase. Oh. And so to get to get those endorsements to actually put on the back cover means that as soon as you're writing your manuscript, you pretty much need to be finding people who would give an endorsement or it's called a blurb because you have to time the print production so that that information's already available on the cover. It's not something you do once after everything's done. Now, what you're talking about are pre-publication reviews. Uh, and if you can get them, that is great. The Midwest Book Review is a post-publication review. Mm -hmm. So by the time you get to us, you'll have some of that information. Now, uh, there is one way you can get a Midwest Book Review pre-publication review, but it costs 50 bucks as a reader fee that goes to the reviewer, not to the Midwest Book Review. Mm -hmm. And there's an eight to 10 week time frame. Uh, so if you want to, and, and the 50 bucks guarantees you a review. Now, whether the review is going to be a favorable or unfavorable depends on your book and the, and the reviewer's assessment. But you do get a chance to see the review and approve of it before it's forwarded to me. Because my benefit from putting the two of you together is I get to run that review in the author's uh, be behalf under the reviewer's byline in one of our publications called Reviewer's Book Watch. But try the for the freebie. <laughs> well, I, as, we, as we wrap up today's session, thank you for talking about cover. And thank you for talking about trends. And I hope that our listening audience realizes the complexity of timing. I, I know with my novel, I actually started writing it 12 years prior to getting a contract. Once I got the contract, then the book was in a production cycle for about 19 months where it went through the rounds of editing, cover yeah. design, interior layout. So there's a lot that happens and it, it, it takes time. And even if someone wanted to self-publish, if, if you want to survive, then I think you want to pay heed to having endorsements, investing in a, an attractive cover, having it edited. And I know sometimes just getting an editor who has a great reputation, they take a deposit and they're looking at anywhere from a 90 day to a four month reserve. So if I sent my manuscript today, I may not get it edited till next month. Okay, we're about out of time, buddy. We'll talk soon, and thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye.